this point, we have quite a bit of machinery behind us, and we can now really start to think about the properties of an image and what happens when you play with the various parameters and settings on a camera. So let me go back to where we started um, at the very beginning and start talking about how we can now start putting together these camera models, the perspective model and the lens and the aperture to start to think about what is happening out here in the image from the physical world. So remember the first thing we talked about was exposure. How does the camera know how to expose a photo? Well, what do you want? When you take a photo of me, you want me to be well exposed, not too dark, not too bright. Um, and the way the camera does that is it balances a number of things, some of which we've seen and some of which we are about to introduce. So there's three basic, there's four, four basic things that you are controlling in an imaging system. One of them you have very little control over, which is just the scene brightness, how much light is in the room. So for example, here in this room right now, as I'm being filmed, there are these two big lights behind me. There's a bunch of lights behind me and it is flooding with me with light. And that was a conscious decision. We chose to do that. And that's that. The camera now has to deal with whatever was set up here in studio. And the camera has at its disposal some more things. It has, let's go all the way back to here, the aperture. We already know what that is. How big is the the lens, how big, or you can have a big lens and a small aperture, by the way, those are not necessarily related, but how big is that entryway in which light comes in? The bigger the entryway, the bigger the aperture, the more light comes in, number one. Number two is shutter. How long, when you open the shutter, you allow light to flood in before you close it, do you allow? You have control over that. And then the third thing is the ISO or the sensitivity of a sensor which says, how much light do I need before I say that I have enough information to make a recording? And so these three things are going to play off with the scene brightness. And what happens when you push on a standard, say, mobile device where you have very little control over these various parameters, it finds a balance. It finds some balance between the things it can control, aperture, shutter, and ISO, with the desire to create a well-exposed and high quality image. Um, so we're gonna be looking at this table a little bit, so let me tell you what we're looking at. So here, from top to bottom for brightness is a dark scene to a bright scene. And, uh, and the next one is the uh, ISO, which is less sensitive to more sensitive. So the more sensitive you are, the less light you need. Um, the shutter says that you have a very slow, a slow shutter, so it, it, takes, it opens and stays open for several seconds lots of light comes pouring in to a very fast uh, shutter of say one two thousandths of a second where it opens and closes very quickly. And then the last one of course is the aperture. So a, we're doing this in terms of F number. So the smaller the number, the larger the aperture, the larger the number, the smaller the aperture. So I have four things, aperture, shutter, sensitivity, and brightness. And for a photo to be well exposed, what I need to be true is for this exposure equation to hold, which says that the shutter speed, T, is equal to the ratio of the F number, N squared, divided by the sensitivity, S, uh, times the brightness, B. So if that equation holds, you have a well-exposed photo. And so what the camera does is it balances these things with varying priorities. But all these things are not interchangeable. Yeah? So in particular, in this table, what I'm showing you here, um, in each column are images taken with different apertures, shutters, and ISOs. And then from top to bottom, we have increasing aperture to decreasing aperture. So we have big aperture, small aperture. In shutter, we have long exposure, short exposure. In ISO, we have high sensitivity to low sensitivity. And you can see that what happens when you have a big aperture and a long exposure and very sensitive, you blow out, right? What's happening here is that you are too, too overexposed. And if you have a too small of an aperture and too small of a, uh, too short of a shutter and not very sensitive, well, then you're too dark over here. And in the middle, eh, things seem to sort of work uh, fairly well. Now, it would seem, just looking at this table, that you know, all things are created equal. Like You can just pick one or the other and who cares? But it's gonna turn out that's actually not quite the case. So for example, let's look at this image right here. This is an image 
taken with a small aperture. So we, we stopped down the aperture, not a, light is com not a lot of light is coming through that lens, but we had a long shutter. We waited a long time. And what do you notice? So in the, this is actually a, obviously a 3D scene where there's some motion is that pinwheel that the young girl is holding is blurred. Well, why? Well, because it, the longer you wait as things move, they blur across the sensor because they're being imaged to different locations. On the other hand, notice that the young girl and all the way back in the playground is imaged in focus because you have a small aperture, you have a wide depth of focus as we have previously seen. Now let's just switch these two. We're gonna have now a large aperture, lots of light comes in, but a very short uh, shutter. Notice by the way that the photo more or less looks the same. I've controlled, I have these two degrees of freedom for the light, how much light spatially and how much light, light temporally. But now notice something interesting. The pinwheel is very crisp. Why? Well, I had a short exposure. Open the shutter, close the shutter, and the pinwheel doesn't move very much. But now notice that I have a narrow depth of focus. In the background, we are blurry, and in the foreground, we are sharp. So we've traded off these two things. Which is better? Which is worse? I don't know. It depends. Um, if you have a really fast moving scene, you need to have a short exposure. If you are a sports photographer or you're photographing race cars, if you want anything to come out, you have to have a very short exposure, which means you have to have a really big aperture or very sensitive sensor in order to create well exposed photos. And you have to balance these things depending on what's happening in your scene. Similarly with ISO. Um, it's not just that, I mean, if, you, if, if, if the ISOs were all the same, you would just have a very sensitive ISO and, and get the maximum out of your light, but that's not the way it works. So shown on the top are two images taken with two different ISOs where I played with the shutter and the aperture to get the same exposure. And what I'm showing you down below is a magnified view of the eye. And what you notice here in right here with the very high sensitivity is that it's noisier. The pixel values are not uniform the way you see over with an ISO of 100. And the reason here is that it's so sensitive, it needs very little photons in order to convert to a digital signal, and it's noisy. It's just noisy because you're not waiting long enough to get enough photons to make sure you're integrating out whatever noise is happening in the sensor. And so there's a price to be paid for these really, really sensitive sensors in terms of noise. Now, is this a problem? Is it not a problem? It depends. If I'm going to take a multi-megapixel image and downsample it by many, many factors, well, maybe I don't care about noise. Maybe that'll just get blurred out. On the other hand, if I want to reason about these high-resolution images, this type of noise is actually quite a bit of a problem. So now we see sort of putting all the pieces together. So we had this lens that focuses light. Um, we have the size of the aperture, which uh, controls how much light comes in spatially. We have the shutter, how long is the camera open, which controls the amount of light that comes in temporally. And then we have the sensitivity of the sensor that tells us how much light do we need before we say we have a pixel value. And they trade off. Uh, large aperture, narrow depth of focus. Uh, long shutter, motion blur. Uh, high sensitivity, lots of noise in the image, and inversely. So what's right and what's wrong? Again, it depends on your needs. If you are building a self-driving car, you probably don't want to have a lot of motion blur because things are moving fast in the street. So you probably want to have a short exposure, which means you either need a high sensitivity or a large aperture. Ooh, is a large aperture good for a, a self-driving car? I don't know. I sort of want to be able to see far. So maybe you just need super um, uh, sensitive sensors, or maybe you need different types of imaging devices. Maybe you image an IR um, instead of the visible spectrum. And so these things have to trade off and they trade off depending on what your underlying application is. But what's critical here is to understand that exposure equation and how these three parameters and the scene brightness determine what a photo will look like.